Thank you very much, Casper, and thank you to uh, the organizer for inviting me. Just uh, a quick introduction on who I am. I'm uh, Eugenio Quintieri, I'm the Secretary General of the European Builders Confederation. We are the political organization representing small and medium enterprise in the construction sector in uh, Europe. And just let me. What is it doing? The big green one. Ah, uh, uh, the big green one. All right. Thank you. So, uh, yeah, we have uh, 19 members in 16 countries. So, here you cannot see Ireland, but there is also Ireland. Um, the idea is really to represent the, the small and medium enterprise in the construction sector at European level, going from small contractors to installers, so electricians, plumbers, joiners, and so on. Um, just to give you a bit an understanding of the, of the construction industry, how big it is, I mean, we represent 9% of the GDP of the European Union, and it's an industry with uh, 3.4 million enterprise and eight 18 million workers, so quite uh, unbalanced when it comes to uh, the, the youth and the women employed in uh, the, the sector. So it's a quite, uh, how to call it, conservative sector, but it's uh, changing a lot. And, the, um, and it's a reality made of the, the backbone of the European economy, it means uh, uh, really the small enterprise, 94.1% Ni is composed of uh, micro enterprises. That in European uh, glossary it means uh, less than 10 people uh, employed. And then you can see the other numbers. It means that we are really talking about very, very small uh, enterprise. And this aspect needs to be taken into consideration when we talk about uh, cir circular economy, digitalization, and so on uh, and so forth. Uh, because I think uh, today it was said uh, um, different times that in the circular economy we need leaders, and it's very true. And I think here we have uh, two good examples uh, with uh, Pablo, with uh, with Casper. But then we have uh, also to understand th that there is also uh, mm, a, a reality where there are no many leaders, and you, you are talking with uh, companies that have been that have been living a uh, harsh financial crisis, that didn't have the enough uh, funds in order to invest uh, in uh, new uh, technologies, in uh, circular economy uh, processes. We, uh, we, uh, we need to face the reality and find pragmatic solutions in order to change the whole mindset in the uh, construction sector. So a uh, few numbers, uh, uh, this uh, it was said today by uh, Mr. Lemons uh, that 40% uh, 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 at the world level uh, uh, it's generated waste, we do a bit less in, uh, uh, in Europe, it's 25, 30%. Uh, uh, and the level of uh, recycling varies between uh, the different member states with numbers that go from 10 to uh, 90%. This means that we have a huge potential when it comes to reducing the environmental uh, impact of the construction sector. These are the main new policy on uh, construction and demolition waste. You have the waste framework directive uh, with 70% uh, uh, of uh, non-hazardous non construction and demolition waste that has to be recycled or recovered by 2020. The circular economy package that puts uh, um, the circular economy in the construction sector as one of the five uh, priority areas. You have the EU construction demolition waste protocol with guideline about the management of uh, waste in the construction sector with best practice and definition of and checklist for practitioners. And finally, levels that try to give a life cycle assessment uh, for the construction sector in order to assess per every uh, cycle, um, every, fa every phase of the cycle, uh, all the measures that can be taken in order to uh, reduce the environmental impact uh, of uh, uh, construction. Uh, w but when once, uh, I always say that once you set the targets, you also need to find a way to reach those targets. And um, we are uh, in the construction sector, we face uh, some challenges when it comes to uh, deliver uh, to uh, these challenges. First of all, um, as craftsmen, we don't deal with most of the times with um, huge amount uh, of, uh, of waste. So you have a small quantity of, of waste that 
uh, cannot be brought to uh, urban uh, waste uh, sites. Yeah. So you need to go to authorized plants that are sometimes a few, they are distant from the place where you are, and uh, the cost uh, is uh, quite expensive. Uh, in my opinion, the what is the uh, solution that you take uh, uh, in these cases? Either uh, you leave it to the one who is responsible for the waste, or you do it illegally in a way uh, or another because you don't see the economic uh, uh, advantage. And it was said in a way uh, today, the fact that circular economy is economy in the sense that you need to make a business case. That is not always uh, easy if you take the market conditions because uh, the value of the material sometimes cannot offset the cost of uh, for collection and uh, uh, recycling. You have policies in uh, some member states where recycling and reusing is not very convenient. So if sending your waste to the disposal it's much cheaper than uh, reusing and, uh, and uh, recycling. Um, there is a lack of trust towards uh, a recycled projects, and then I can make maybe two examples. You have uh, a good example like the, um, the one presented uh, by uh, Pablo. I was in a jury once uh, for uh, projects on circular economy uh, done uh, by small and medium enterprise. The, the goodwill was there, but then the reality was that no one was checking the safety and the conditions of uh, 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 the material. Yeah, there is the goodwill of going to towards circular economy, but then when it comes to all the standards that have to be met when, when we talk about safety, they were not uh, there. So we need to find uh, a case. Um, then you have, uh, um, for the craftsmen always like a lack of space because if you build, uh, I don't know, if you want to demolish here in Brussels, uh, I mean, it is. I, I think it is difficult to have uh, all the needed uh, uh, waste uh, uh, containers when you are really building uh, and you are close between two buildings and you have already the street in front of you and you cannot put your waste con containers over there and make uh, a selective uh, um, a choice of the materials on site. You have uh, more and more entangled materials uh, given to the fact that uh, you have uh, prefabrication, new insulation uh, uh, techniques. And uh, re recycling and reusing and remanufacturing, and it was said today, needs also some specific skills from the ones that are uh, on site in order to, to make a good selection of the waste uh, that is uh, uh, pro um, produced. And uh, uh, the use of new products and, uh, of course, having a, a functional construction and demolition waste management and recovery um, system. And of course, we also need more information on uh, uh, the construction uh, waste, especially to check the presence of hazardous substances. And uh, um, there is a kind of general lack of, of uh, reliable data on the waste generated. These are the challenges, so a bit of pessimistic view, and uh, what we can do about this. Um, we, of course, are for the 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 promotion of inno innovative construction uh, material uh, like self-filling concrete that use uh, uh, bacteria in, uh, as an healing uh, for uh, um, removing the cracks from the concrete and other of course in innovative material that we have as uh, the innovations that are coming from uh, um, from steel as it was well explained uh, today and of course also green construction materials that are mainly uh, linked to uh, uh, insulation uh, material. Uh, how to answer to these uh, uh, challenges? First of all, uh, demolition and construction sites as a real en engine for the valorization of uh, uh, the, the material. And also the we have to facilitate the transition, it was said different times today, from the waste to a product. It was said uh, uh, waste uh, uh, like this is, it doesn't have uh, an identity, it's, uh, it's without a soul. A in order to do this, the, the checks that have to be done, of course you need to start from data that come from uh, the original product, but the, the quality and the characteristic that have to be taken into account is to the resulting product uh, after uh, the uh, demolition. Of course the exchange of good practice because there are, as we witnessed today, and establish a system on the ground. It means really that we involve all the actors of the construction value chain in order uh, to uh, treat the waste as should be treated. Um, decrease the construction companies to use uh, um, 
uh, recycled uh, uh, materials uh, once anyway the needed safety checks have been uh, uh, made but today there is a kind of lack of trust on uh, uh, materials that are recycled or that need to be uh, uh, reused um, the I was talking earlier about the fact that uh, sometimes the, uh, the, the, the points that authorize to collect material that are recycled uh, is quite far away and you have a few, it's expensive to transfer that, especially when you have uh, small materials. Uh, that's why we always invite, especially the member states and uh, the local communities to create uh, enough uh, uh, mm, sites of collection of this kind of waste that cannot be disposed anyway in uh, uh, urban centers. Um, the poor market uh, of uh, uh, recycled aggregate and demolition materials is a reality. That's why we ask for a support uh, when it comes to the, um, the use of recycled materials, so in public procurement or, or in other cases, gi giving some uh, uh, preference to the ones that use uh, recycled materials, but at the same time, disincentivize uh, the, um, the, the, the pure and the mere disposal uh, of, uh, of material in a normal ways that uh, for material that is not going to be recycled. Uh, of course, it's going in a way, uh, it's a negative incentive, but in a way it's going to uh, put some uh, support for uh, recycled materials. Um, we need more information on uh, um, waste, so improve the waste identification through oblig obligatory pre-demolition pre uh, audits, but also having a better uh, um, management uh, and better information through uh, digital technologies. So I, I was very mm, fascinated today by the, uh, the, the example that it was uh, uh, presented by Pablo, because today in the construction sector, we are having a lot of talks about digitalization. I always say that I spent 90% uh, uh, percent of the last year talking about digitalization in the construction sector. And uh, we are now uh, considering the fact of having a digital platform in uh, uh, the construction sector at European level that can help uh, this, uh, uh, this process. The construction sector has started with uh, um, paper uh, uh, data and paper design and we have moved to CAD, we have moved to uh, other system, we have uh, now building information uh, modeling. But this common data environment, uh, it is uh, a reality for uh, certain actors, uh, I would say, of the construction sector, and I would say that the architects mostly is one of, of the actors. The truth is that for the circular economy objectives, we need uh, uh, something more. We need uh, a kind of supra level, like uh, in a way Pablo is trying uh, to do, whether you can have, uh, a, a first of all, a collection of metadata, and once you have the metadata, you need to be able to uh, put them together and try to make some assessments when it comes to energy efficiency, when it comes to uh, circular economy. But the reality is that we are very far from this in uh, uh, the construction sector. Uh, most of, uh, in most of the cases, uh, like our companies in, in some cases, do not have the, mm, the, mm, the technological uh, expertise that is needed to do this kind uh, of, of operation. That's why we, when it comes to building information modeling and whatever it is linked in a way to the digital world, I keep saying that whether the examples given by Pablo and Casper, I think, are very, very relevant, and we need this kind of leadership in order to boost the sector. We need also to find a way to massify this kind of examples towards uh, the vast majority of the industry that is composed of uh, small and medium uh, ent enterprise. So having uh, uh, very easy digital uh, tools on which you can make a picture and you see only a few data of the ones, ones that are needed. If you talk about building information modeling, having a filter, if you're a plumber, you have a filter where you see only the data that, uh, that, are, uh, that, that you need. And also you can put a few data that you are able uh, to put. This is what uh, we really need in order to have a real digitalization and of course a big advantage and benefit also for the circular economy. Uh, of the sector. Of course, this comes with the, with the needs of upskilling up uh, the, the sector. The sector is today living uh, a serious uh, um, shortage of uh, 
um, of skills. We need a good training and uh, qualification uh, schemes and an higher financial support in order to uh, upskill the current workers in a way, but also to, um, to train the new ones that need uh, new skills. And you see a different uh, sector, there is a different sector. Uh, it's the end, last one. <laughs> and uh, we need, uh, we need a, a different sector because it, the sector is changing. You need ma many more digital skills and that's where we have to intervene also to attract women and young uh, people to the sector. So that was all. I thank you for uh, your attention and uh, it's uh, the time uh, for me to introduce the next speaker who is Paolo Falcioni, who is Director General of uh, Aplia, Home Appliance Europe. Thank you very much.